Night is descending on a walled town in the eastern part of India, a town that has just escaped destruction. Celebrations have been raging for almost two days. The city has been saved by its righteous devotion to Lord Shiva. It was very lucky that the priest of Shiva arrived when he did. At his direction, the city leaders threw down the town idols, and like a miracle, the army that had been besieging the city disappeared. But strangely enough, the priest has also disappeared, and no one has seen him since the army left. Perhaps he was truly an emissary of God. Whatever the reason, the people are just happy to be alive. But as the town leader, you can't help but feel a little anxious. Was it really a miracle? Where did that priest go? The festivities may be dying down as the night wears on, but your worries are most certainly not. It's been a long night, and it's time for you to head home and get some sleep. On your way back, you hear a strange sound in the distance. You peer down the street into the darkness and see the town gate sitting wide open. But that gate should be shut tight after dark. And there is a man standing in the doorway. It's hard to tell from here, but it looks like that priest of Shiva. And he was gone. You stare into the darkness as the ominous sounds begin to grow. Welcome to Rogue Records, where we invite you to sit back, relax, and hear the true tale, History's Elephant Overlord. In the eastern part of India, under the rule of the Nanda Empire, villagers live under the strict Hindu caste system that governs their lives and the futures of their children. The highest caste in the system are the Brahmins, a caste whose members are expected to become priests and scholars. In 375 BC, a baby named Chanakya is born to a Brahmin family and sent to the priests for a blessing and a prophecy. The baby was unusual in that even at only a few months old, he already had some teeth, and the priests took this as a sign that the child was meant for very great things. The elder priest of the temple called Chanakya's father over to give him the news of his son's bright future. This child's teeth bear witness to the greatness of his future. He will fulfill the greatest of ambitions and be king over the people. He will be known far and wide. But Chanakya's father Chanan was a cruel and jealous man, and he didn't want his son to be king. For a Brahmin being priest should be enough, and his envy of his own son's prophesied greatness led him to try to stop this prophecy in the most brutal way possible by breaking the baby's teeth. He then returned to the priests for a new prophecy. What have you done? You have robbed this boy of his future and disfigured his face. But he won't be king now, will he? No, he will not. But even you cannot stop a star from shining completely. He may not be king, but he will be a king's advisor and the power behind the throne. Now you listen well, Chanin. The gods have a great destiny for this boy. Do no more evil to him, lest your curse fall upon you. Now be gone from my sight. While the evil in Shannon's heart was not completely sated, the knowledge that his son would not be a king satisfied his black soul. Time passes and the baby grows into a young boy. And he does so in a beautiful place filled with forests to explore, streams to swim in, and all manner of great hiding spots. But the ongoing cruelties of his father had left scars on the boy, both physically and emotionally. Scars that would affect how everyone treated Chinakya. He would watch the other children laughing and playing happily together. He would see how much fun they were having, and like any child, he desperately wanted to join in with them and have fun too. 
but the injuries inflicted upon him by his father had left his face and jaw deformed, making him shy and self-conscious, and not without good reason. Hi, my name is Chinatya. Can I play with you? Why is your face all weird and gross? It's all lumpy like a potato. Yeah, he's a potato face. <laughs> potato face. Because potato children face. can be very, face. very potato cruel. Face. The only person he could really rely on was his mother, who was his biggest and only supporter. Those little brats. Don't listen to them, Chinakya. They are beneath you. You are a Brahmin. You will be a powerful man when you grow up. Then they'll see. Don't forget how they treated you. Use it. Study hard. Be diligent. And one day you will be at the right hand of the king, and then these peasants will be sorry. And Chinakya's life continued on this way, abused by his father and rejected by the other children, with his mother constantly reminding him of his great destiny as the king's right hand. So it's not really any surprise that as he grew, he became cold, ambitious, and vengeful. But he also studied very hard, the single-minded determination that when his opportunity came to seize power, he would be ready. After learning all he could in his home region, Chinakya decided to seek even greater knowledge. But for that, he would need more money. So he went to see the Nanda king in the capital city of Patliputra. The Nanda king was known to be generous towards Brahmins on feast days, and Chanakya hoped that it might be time for his destiny as a king's favorite advisor to finally begin. The Nanda king was receiving supplicants for the holiday, and it was Chanakya's turn. Are you sure this is a Brahmin? He looks more like an untouchable to me. Yes, my king, we are sure. All right. As long as you're sure. Boy, why are you here? Great King, I have studied all of the great arts. Philosophy, religion, mathematics, and alchemy. I wish to further my knowledge at the great university at Taxala and seek your majesty's aid to pay for this. In exchange, I promise to return and serve you as an advisor when I have completed my studies. <laughs> and why would I want such an ugly advisor? You will scare away all my courtesans. <laughs> but you are wise to seek my aid in this. I mean, your only hope is to study. Here, take this for your university. Or maybe you can buy a different face. <laughs> Chinakya quickly gathered up all of the coins the king had given him. And while this was why he came here, he was also thoroughly crushed. He had thought that here his looks wouldn't matter, that the king would see his value and he could start the life of importance and status he had been dreaming of since he was a young child. But the laughter of the king at his court showed him just how wrong he was. But his faith in the Jain prophecy was unshaken. If this king was not the one he would serve, then he would simply have to raise up a new king himself and throw this one out. So with the seed money the king himself provided, Shinakya set out to learn all he could to ensure that Nanda would never laugh at him again. Over the next five years, Shinakya studied at Taxila and mastered many disciplines. In particular, herbalism and alchemy, the creation of potions, medicines, and poisons. With these new masteries, he set about looking for a likely candidate that he could help build up into a king that could challenge the Nanda. His experience in Patliputra had shown him that someone who was already powerful or biased would be unlikely to look to him for advice, so he would have to find some impressionable person that he could mold if he was going to be the trusted advisor. But the ideal candidate should also come from a good bloodline to make it easier to legitimize their rise to the throne. To find such an individual, Chinakya made his way to the city of Patna, just a stone's throw away from Patlaputra. Here he began making a name for himself as a healer and teacher, all the while searching for the right protege. And as luck would have it, the 
perfect opportunity to gain such a protege fell into Chinakia's lap when the town chief came to the learned healer to ask for a personal favor. Teacher, you must help me. My daughter is very ill and the doctors do not know what is wrong with her. Please, she is also pregnant with my grandchild. You must help me. Chinakia followed the chief to his home where he found the young woman deathly ill. After examining her, he found she had a fever, was drifting in and out of consciousness, and was also about six months pregnant, just as the chief had told him. After completing the exam, he had both good news and bad news for her father. Good sir, you were right to call for me. Your daughter has a rare disease that only a few scholars know of, but I'm not sure that I will be able to help her. Why? Can you not make a cure? Does it have no cure? No, it has a cure and I can make it. But the ingredients are very expensive, and making the cure is extremely dangerous. It could kill me just creating it. Saving your daughter would require me to risk my own life. I I don't think I can help you. Please, teacher. I will pay any price to save my daughter and grandchild. Name it, and it's yours. I swear to Shiva. You understand that having sworn this to a Brahmin priest, the gods will hold you to this promise. Yes, anything to save them. Very well, I will start immediately. It's unclear what made the girl ill in the first place. It's also unclear what medicine Chinakia was actually making for her. What is clear is that this turn of events would put the chief and his daughter into Chinakia's debt in a very powerful way. Now look, I'm not saying Chinakia was the one responsible for her illness, although he was capable of creating many poisons and their antidotes. But I'm also not not saying that, if you know what I mean. With the cure in hand, Chinakia made his way back to an anxious chief's home in order to administer the medicine to a very, very sick young woman. And just a couple of days later, she regained consciousness and began to quickly recover. It was like a miracle. She had been at death's door, and now, thanks to this Brahmin priest, she was regaining strength, and her baby was safe, at least for now. With his daughter recovered and his grandchild safe, it was time for the town chief to settle his debt with the savior priest. It's just too bad he had never agreed upon the price. Thank you, teacher. You have my gratitude, and anything I have is yours. Possessions do not interest me. I have much to learn and do, and cannot be tied down by such things. What I need is a student that I can pass on my wisdom to. Thus, as compensation for saving the lives of your daughter and grandchild, if the child is a boy, he shall be given to me as a disciple. What? You can't take my baby. A child needs his mother. You go too far. Calm yourselves. I have neither the will nor the inclination to raise a baby. He will remain with you. When he has come of age, I shall return, and he shall be well educated and live a life of greatness, guided by all the wisdom of the ages. This is my price, the price you swore to the gods you would pay my good chief. Will you break your oath and bring a curse upon your house? Well, I... I mean... No. But not until he is of age. Agreed. Farewell. Chinakya had accomplished his goal. He had identified a likely candidate that he would be able to mold, and one that had an important pedigree because not only was he the grandson of a powerful chief, but it was also a poorly kept secret that the child's father was the Nanda king himself. Now that this was complete, he left Patna to build the wealth and connections necessary to not only educate the child, but to provide the arms and army needed to support his uprising. Also, it was probably not a good idea to hang out in the town where you just rumple stiltskinned away the chief's grandson before he was even born. Twelve years have passed since Chinakya was last in Patna, and in that time he has amassed a fortune. Some say he was a famous healer that charged exorbitant sums, but the patient always recovered. Others that he discovered the alchemical secret of making gold. And yet others say that he was adept at being a gambling cheat. However he did it, he was finally financially ready to begin his career as a kingmaker, literally. He walked into the area around Patna, anxious to meet his new young protege. 
He had a lot of hopes for this boy, but he had no idea if his personality was suited to rule, or if he could even be taught. Just outside of the city, he came across a group of boys playing in a field. One of the boys seemed to be in charge, and was wearing a small headdress made of straw. He sent the other boys out on make-believe missions of adventure. Janakia approached the boys to ask them if they knew his new student. Hello there, young men. What are your boys playing at? Are you the chief of these boys? No, I'm not the chief. That's my grandfather. I'm the king. Oh ho, the king? My apologies, your majesty. I was looking for the chief. And what name shall I call you by, my king? My name is Chandra Gupta Maria. My grandfather is in the city. You can go in by that gate over there. As the boys turned back to play, Chinakya couldn't help but smile. It seems his protege did indeed have the disposition to be king after all. Now it was time to go tell the boy's mother and grandfather that the time had finally come. I was hoping that you would never come back, that you were busy elsewhere. Or dead? I am very much alive and I have returned for the boy as we agreed. Don't be so upset. I'll take the boy to Taxala and educate him. I promise you, I will make him into a great man. He will live a life of importance and impact. The boy's mother kept her word, and though it broke her heart to see her son go, she knew that the scholar was very skilled, and she hoped that her son would indeed become a great man. Still, it was very hard to let go. And so young Chandragupta set out with his new teacher and mentor. Together, they would embark on a journey that would take them to the university at Taxila, and from there, on to greatness. At Taxila, Chinakya had the boy educated in the arts and philosophy, but his primary course of study was war, the tactics and strategies of all the greatest conquerors and generals throughout history. By the time he was 18, Chandragupta had been prepared to take his throne by force. With an army of mercenaries financed by Chinakya at his back and the martial wisdom of the ages in his head, Chandragupta began his campaign against the Nanda by marching directly for Patlaputra. Battle was joined outside the walls of the city, but the Nanda forces were more numerous than Chandragupta's and had a fortified city as their stronghold, filled with stockpiles of weapons and supplies. Despite all his training and study, it seems there is simply no substitute for battlefield experience, and the forces Chinakya had gathered were routed. The pair fled the field and into the countryside. With their forces scattered and the Nanda in pursuit, they would need to go to ground, and so they headed for a small town north of Patlaputra on the way to modern-day Paul. In this small town, Chinaki would find both inspiration and discouragement, wisdom and ignorance, extremes that would shape his plans for the future. He saw a young woman cooking the nightly meal for herself and her young daughter. She carefully prepared the materials and cooked the stew over an open fire pit on the edge of town. Chinaki watched as the little girl stabbed her spoon into the center of the pot took a big bite, and immediately started wailing as the hot stew burned her mouth. No, BT. You can't take a big bite from the center of the pot. You'll have to take a small spoonful from the edge and carefully blow on it first or you will burn yourself. This simple truth, imparted by a mother to her child, struck Chinakya like a blow. This is precisely what was wrong with his strategy with the Nanda. He had struck at the center of the pot, where it was hottest and deepest. He should have done was take bites out of the edges of the empire, smaller chunks he could handle while simultaneously draining the center of resources. While pondering his new plan, Chinakya and Chandragupta were approached by the townsfolk. What business do you men have here? Good sir, we are just passing through and need to purchase some food and supplies for our journey. You'll find no supplies here. You're with that army the Nanda are looking for. 
Get out of here at once! Though it galled him greatly, Chanakya led Chandragupta out of the city and back into the night. As they walked on, the Brahmin polymath was devising a new plan, one that would require allies near the outlying areas of the Empire. And his mind, always working, also made a special note of the city they had just left and the poor treatment they received. In order to convince other rulers in the area to support his protege, Chanakya would first need to conquer some territory and install Chandragupta as regent there. So they headed northwest toward modern-day Nepal. And since conquering territory requires troops, Chanakya used his considerable wealth to once again hire more mercenaries along the way. It was also around this time that Chanakya began to gather elephants to bolster his martial forces. The enormously powerful behemoths would come to play a central role in all of their campaigns going forward and become the driving force behind their conquests. With their forces replenished, they quickly conquered two regions along the Nepalese border, and were finally ready to begin negotiations with another ruler to help them unseat the Nanda, a king by the name of Parvatak. So, you want me to help you defeat the Nanda? Why should I? I have my own kingdom already. The Nanda have already conquered everything to the south of you. What makes you think they will stop there? Your kingdom will be next. Help us, and not only will you protect your own kingdom, but expand it with new lands. Hmm. Perhaps. Those beasts of yours have already proven very effective. How many do you have? Several hundred, and growing. Hmm. If I am to help you then, once the Empire is defeated, I want half of their lands. As you say, good king, it shall be so. With agreements made, the combined forces set about conquering the land surrounding Patlaputra. But there was one fortified city that posed a problem. Their thick walls would mean a siege that could take months, and they simply didn't have the time to waste, as the Nanda would use the delay to further prepare. So, Chanakya infiltrated the town, disguised as a Shivite priest. He convinced the townsfolk that the army was the retribution of Lord Shiva for their idolatry, and that the army would leave them in peace if they simply threw down their idols. They followed his advice, and the army left, just as Chanakya had foretold. The people celebrated and let down their guard, allowing Chanakya to sneak a few soldiers into the town to sabotage the gates. Suffice it to say that Lord Shiva did not save that town. With that, Patliputra had lost nearly all of its nearby forces, and was cut off from the further reaches of the empire. The forces of Chandragupta and Parvatak had surrounded the city, and the Nanda king was left with no way out. So instead of fighting a battle he couldn't win, the king decided to negotiate his surrender to his best advantage. King Chandragupta, let us avoid needless bloodshed and agree on the terms of Patliputra's surrender. I will cede you my capital city and your northern empire will have its crown jewel. I will take my family, my court of advisors, and my possessions and head south into my own kingdom. You will have your victory without losing any soldiers. But Chandragupta was no fool. He had Chanakya for a teacher, after all, and knew when to be ruthless. No, you have no southern kingdom. It is now mine. And you will have neither possessions nor advisors lest you try to rise against me later. I will allow you and your family to leave here alive, with only what you can carry in a single car and one of your daughters will remain here as my wife. 
This is the only terms you will get. Except now, or die. And so it was that Chanakya and Chandragupta overthrew the Nanda Empire. And Chandragupta gained a new wife, who was also the daughter of a king. But this was not to be the only royal wedding. There was another young and beautiful maid at the palace that had caught the attention of King Parvatak. And so, a wedding for Chandragupta's ally and co-emperor was planned immediately. The massive celebration was a combination of victory party, wedding, and state-sponsored propaganda all rolled into one. The entire city was in attendance to witness the birth of the empire and the nuptials of one of its regents. Parvatak and his new bride were resplendent in their wedding attire. Freshly groomed, perfumed, and bejeweled, they presented an image of splendor to the people. An image that was about to be shattered. With a pained expression, Parvatak suddenly collapsed to the floor. Seeing her husband wincing in pain, his body rigid on the floor, his new wife screamed out, and the party fell silent. I think that he is dying. No, no. Probably just some bad panier. I can't move. My guts are on fire. My heart is pounding. I think we should send for a doctor. He'll be fine. I've seen this before. Just give him a minute. I'm dying. Just walk it off, you big baby. <sighs> He's dead? Hmm. Would you look at that? Oh no. Well... At least you won't have to share the empire now, will you? The official story is that the bride was a Visha Kanya, or a female assassin who ingests small amounts of poison so that her saliva and perspiration is actually poisonous. However, it should be noted that the source for the official story was Chanakya himself. So, take that with a grain of salt. As the Mauryan Empire was still new, one of the most important tasks that Chanakya had was to root out and eliminate all vestiges of the Nanda from the seats of government around the empire, to ensure that they could not rise again. So he sent out the army to seek out Nanda loyalists, or at least that was the primary goal. But it wasn't the only goal. My lord. Why have you summoned me and my daughter before you? Once, long ago, you taught me a valuable lesson, one that I have used to great advantage in the years since. And since I respect wisdom above all else, I want to pay my lesson fee to you. So, if you also respect wisdom, you will take your family and flee the city before nightfall. Tell no one you are leaving or why, or there will be dire consequences. Do you understand? The woman was confused. She didn't remember teaching this general anything. But seeing the soldiers and war elephants with him, she simply nodded her agreement and heeded its words. And it was fortunate for her that she did. Because Chanakya's true goal was revenge. Revenge on that city that had driven him out when he had needed supplies. And he got his revenge with blood and fire. He made those villagers pay for their poor treatment of him and Chandragupta. And this mission of stabilizing the new empire really became Chanakya's personal revenge tour. So if you had ever disrespected Chanakya, called him names, excluded him from play, or abused him in any way, this was a pretty bad time for him to be in the Empire. And all the while, his mother's words to him echoed in his ears. Don't forget how they treated you. Use it. And one day you will be at the right hand of the king, and then these peasants will be sorry. Her words proved prescient. For all those on Chanakya's grievance list, we're very, very sorry indeed. Luckily, the overwhelming majority of the Empire subjects were not on Chanakya's list. And for them, 
It was a time of great progress under the policies Chinakya devised and Chandragupta implemented. Policies like the construction of roads suitable for carts and carriages. And when I say roads, I really mean a system of well-maintained, interconnected highways all across the empire, facilitating travel and commerce of all kinds. They also built irrigation canals to improve crop quality and yields, ensuring that farmers would harvest bumper crops for their families to eat and for them to sell. And when I say irrigation canals, I mean a system of well-maintained and interconnected canals branching off from rivers and streams, ensuring all citizens had access to plentiful and cheap food. They also brought the production and distribution of arms and armor under the government's direct control. This ensured a well-equipped army and police force as well as keeping such weapons out of the hands of criminals. Of course, this also meant that no one inside the empire would be able to build up their own stockpile of weapons that they would use to rise against the Marian dynasty, a reasonable concern given how they recently came to power themselves. And while Chanakya was busy settling debts, Chandragupta had his own battles to fight. Primarily in the northwestern regions were an invading force that already controlled Gandhara and the northern part of modern-day Pakistan was attempting to push further into his new empire. The invaders were led by a Macedonian warlord who had been a general under Alexander the Great. When Alexander died, his empire had been split among his vassals, and the region to the northwest of India belonged to a man named Seleucius. He took his hoplite southwest in an attempt to take advantage of the new empire's young ruler. The battle-hardened Greek general thought that he and his men were ready to roll over the Marians, that he had seen all the tactics and strategies he needed to, to be victorious. But he was wrong. Phineas, are we ready? Yes, sir. But how should we handle the elephants? Well, like we have before. Keep the phalanx formation and put the spears to them. But sir, there's there's a lot of them. How many? Thirty? Fifty? It looks like several thousand, sir. Thousand? As in one with three zeros after it. Are you sure about this? Yes, sir. Well, uh, let's let's tell the men to. Uh, you know what? You know what? Let's negotiate. We're civilized men after all. Get me a messenger. Full disclosure, I am paraphrasing a bit here. There were battles where the Greeks got elephants stomped, but I thought I'd just cut to the chase. The two sides agreed to a truce where Seleucius would both cede the northwestern land of Gandhara and offer his daughter's hand in marriage to Chandragupta. In exchange, he would get 500 war elephants that he would use to conquer his enemies. You know, in the opposite direction. Now I know 500 elephants sounds like a lot, but keep in mind that records indicate Chandragupta had as many as 9,000 of them. With the empire secure, Chandragupta enjoyed the luxuries it afforded him. Well, as best he could, given that he was the target of several apparent assassination attempts. One such attempt occurred while at dinner with one of his wives, Durdhara, who was also the mother of his son and heir. After taking a bite from his plate, she collapsed to the floor, gasping and rigid. She died there before Chandragupta's very eyes. The official story was that Chanakya had been slowly increasing the amount of poison in Chandragupta's food for years to help him build an immunity to common poisons and thus safeguard him from assassination. And the source for this explanation? Yep, you guessed it, it was Chanakya himself. Funny how that keeps happening. Now maybe that's what happened, or maybe an older, wiser, more confident Chandragupta was just harder to control, and maybe Chinakya would have an easier time with his infant son and heir. 
but I guess we'll never know. After many years of plenty and victory under Chandragupta's leadership, a drought and famine hit India. It lasted for years, and the people across the empire were looking for someone to blame. A pair of Jain Brahmin monks came to Chandragupta's palace with what they claimed was a message from the gods. They said that Chandragupta's conquests had so soaked the soil in blood that as long as he was emperor, nothing would grow. This seemed to Chandragupta to be independent confirmation of something similar he had heard from Chanakya. It should be pointed out, though, that Chanakya was also a Jain Brahmin. So I'm not sure how independent these statements really were. And so, to save his empire and atone for his sins, Chandragupta abdicated the throne to his son Bindusara and lived out the rest of his days in prayer as a reclusive monk. But if Chanakya thought that he would be able to control Bindusara, he was sorely mistaken. For another advisor named Subantu, had already earned the boy's trust and told him that it was Chanakya that had killed his mother. Bindusara confirmed this allegation with the palace nurses and, in a fit of rage, cast Chanakya out of the palace. Chanakya, now an old man, was humiliated by the turn of events and vowed to never eat again, essentially planning to commit suicide by starvation. But Subantu knew that Chanakya's value as a minister and strategist was too great that eventually the emperor would want him to come back. So to protect his own position and prevent future reprisals for his betrayal of the old sage, Subandu killed Chinakya. And just as Chinakya himself had done to his enemies, Subandu burned the old minister's body to destroy the evidence. And so passed Chinakya, a brilliant scholar, cunning strategist, implacable foe, and the driving force behind the largest empire in India's history. To paraphrase J.K. Rowling, Chanakya was a great man. He did some things that were terrible, yes, but great. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and comment down below. I promise to get back to you as soon as I can.